Hi, everyone, and welcome. Rabbi Yisrael Bernath here, and it's a real honor to be here today with Rabbi Benjamin Bressinger. Rabbi, ben Rabbi Bressinger is, uh, he is a director of Chabad Lifeline, which is a crisis and addiction drop-in center in Montreal. And Rabbi, can you just give us an idea of what a regular day looks like for you? Sure, happy to. So, uh, you know, it used to be a drop-in center very much. It used to be situated near Queen Mary Metro, uh, Snowden Metro on Queen Mary. And um, the drop-in crowd um, was made up of uh, people, there was a lot of crack cocaine addiction. There was uh, certainly alcoholism. There was a little bit of uh, homelessness. There was it, was, it was a tough place. It was a tough place, it was a tough crowd and they did magic. People felt at home there. People, it really was a drop in center in every way of it. No one slept there. It was always, uh, you know, outpatient and, um, and they didn't, they were staffed with some very caring people. And, and what does it look like now? So when we came, my wife, um, my wife, uh, probably about uh, close to 30 years ago, went back to school. Um, we, we, uh, we had a shlichas, we were posted for Chabad, uh, Chabad movement in West Orange, New Jersey. And we came across some people with, uh, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous so much so that we became so enamored by them. They, my wife thought for her to truly um, do what she's being sent, right? So all these, all of a sudden wives of people in Alcoholics Anonymous are coming to the house. And, and so for her to really be able to, she said, I'm gonna go back to school. And she went back and she got a master's in social work at Rutgers which we're still paying for. And, um, and she then specialized working with family members of people with addiction. So in 2007, we, uh, we came to Montreal to take that drop-in center, they called it Project Pride, and to take it wherever we want. We were given a free hand, make it happen. And within about a, oh, great story. <laughs> We were on Queen Mary, this building. I don't know if you were in this building. You were in Project yes, Pride. Did you ever come? Yes. Okay. So, so you remember the floors weren't flat? It was yes. such. <laughs> the second floor, it was, it was, it had seen better days. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, by looking at it, you know, you see somebody who's been through a lot. They look a lot older than they are. Yeah. That's this place. So we were getting kicked out. I'm sitting in the office once a guy comes up and he says, listen, I own the con. This is, I own this building. Uh, you have, you have a, a month tops out. We're demolishing the building. What? <laughs> Where am I going to go? You know, it was cheap, very cheap. Uh, so I didn't know the next day, this is a wild story. The next day I'm at an event and uh, I start schmoozing, start speaking to one of the, one of the people there, not knowing who he is, not knowing what he does, just talking. And he was asking me about what we do, what I do. He was very interested in it. You know, I loved hearing him. He was interested. It turned out he it, it was the CFO of the Jewish General Hospital, a guy by the name of Laurent Ziri, who I can say hundreds, maybe thousands, for sure, hundreds of people owe their life to him for what he did. He called me the next day and he said, I know you're saying you're looking for a place. Come on, I'll show you a place. Okay, so we came here to the corner of Coast St. Catherine and Lafla, and there was an old big home that had vines coming down all of the wall. You couldn't see, my kids were younger then, I'm talking about 50 whatever, 14 years ago, my kids thought it was, uh, they called it a haunted house. It looked like a haunted house. It had been abandoned 25 years. It was the original president of the Jewish General Hospital. He built it for his family. And they hadn't lived there for so long. Wow. So Laurent, Laurent said, would this place be, I'm like, oh my God. By the way, the, the, the electricity, it, like, the lighting were hanging. There was no, like, <laughs> it, the walls were, it was a complete disaster. Complete disaster. But I saw such potential. I was like, oh my gosh, what? 
And he got the executive of the Jewish General Hospital and the foundation to go for it. And we've been here since. So, so, so they gave it to you and you had to fix it up though. They fixed it up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the more, if I really talk about it the way I can get all swelled up with, with such a, like, you know, I can argue a lot of times, like saying that, you know, be logical and don't believe in miracles. I can get into that argument with myself, even though I'm a rabbi, but you know, at the end of the day, do I really believe that? I struggle sometimes. Just, but when I tell that story, when I live that, it's like, wow. That's an amazing story. So today you're housed in this place. And what does this place uh, consist of? What does it do? Okay, so uh, my wife, by coming in and being the clinical director, she hired now a whole staff um, that includes, and this tells you what we do by who's here. So we have, um, right now we have three addiction counselors who are working with adults with substance or behavioral addictions. So they call that behavioral or process addiction. So it's not necessarily a substance you're, you're taking in, you're ingesting, but it could be gambling. It could be, we see a lot, probably 20% of what we see here is uh, sex addiction, pornography addiction. Um, and so there's the staff, three full-time working with adults coming in for their own addiction. Then we also have a full staff that works with youth. And youth are, um, I, have a, I have a passion for youth because uh, when I was 11, 12 years old, my brother who's passed away, he was 17, 18 years old and he was out of control, off the walls, insane behavior, insane behavior. And um, thank God, he was, he, he was able to get help. Um, and then actually he died for a different reason uh, at 41. He had acute leukemia, but he, but from the time when he was 20 till 41, he had a family, he, you know, but those few years, me and my little sister watching this happen, watching the dynamic in the house, watching my parents be helpless. That's a, so my real passion in Chabad Lifeline is we got to be looking for the kids who are the hidden victims. Mm. The, these are the kids, they're not necessarily misbehaving. Right. Usually not, but they're in a home where there's some kind of chaos. Right. And, and so that, that's what our youth department is all about. That's what our, a full youth department. Um, we have a behavioral addiction. So we have a sort of a sex addiction therapist who's uh, only two in Quebec. She's here. And do we also have um, um, a full department that reaches out to schools. So who's coming in now? I said in Snowden, Metro, crack addicts and, and home. It's a different type of clientele now. We're not by a subway in the same way. It's just not the same dynamic. So we have, they, they, there's an expression, addicts with two cars in the driveway. Mm. A lot more of that than ever. Uh, a lot more families than ever. Wow. A lot more screen. Uh, they call it uh, 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 screen, not so, tween, tween addiction, which is screens, teenagers on screens. A lot of that we're seeing, a lot of that, especially through the pandemic. So we're free to anybody, not free. We raise a budget, we don't get any government funding, and uh, there's no waiting list. Wow. I, first of all, I'm really sorry about your brother and uh, his memory should be for a blessing. Oh, man. Thank you. I, 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 this question is going to sound very innocent, but it's, I, I want to understand what is addiction? Like you're saying, that, you know, an addict with two cars in the driveway. It sounds like a typical person. How do you know you're an addict? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a, a very um, common question. And usually, a vast majority of the time, if somebody's asking that of themselves, they are an addict. If they're genuinely asking that question, 
And, and let's now, let, let me address it. So there's something called the central organizing principle, COP, of a person's day. So it doesn't mean that I'm drinking the whole day, but it means that um, I'm thinking about it, I'm buying it, I'm hiding it, I'm planning it, I'm feeling bad about it, I'm sleeping it off. I'm the, so it becomes, and that's when kids become secondary. Even a person's own kids become secondary. So if you wanted to think about addiction in a way, it's not about the alcohol. It's not about the behaviors. It's, it's really about the relationship. With, with the behavior. Yeah. The or relationship. With the substance, or, or, or with the substance. Whatever self-sabotaging behaviors or substance, whatever it is, yeah. It's the relationship. Where do I place it as far as my priorities? So for the person who's, um, who has a gambling addiction, for example, I, I see that in substance, but a gambling addiction, how does that manifest itself? Well, uh, you, you mean, how does it, what do we see as far as- Yeah, I'm saying like, like I mean, there's, there's people who, who can go, I mean, here in Montreal, I know people who go to the casino. I've never myself been there, but I know people who go and they spend 200 bucks and that's greater. I know some guys that get together and they have a, a game of cards and, and that's the end of it. How, when does that, look, how does that transfer over to I'm an addict or- Right, so that's the same thing with alcohol, right? It's the same idea. Yeah, there's nothing, you know, you have 200 guys sitting or women sitting and drinking. It doesn't mean they're alcoholics. But, but the numbers actually, if you forget about 200, let's talk about 10 people in a room, 10 people in a room drinking. The, the numbers tell us that at least one of them potentially could be or is an addict. So we're talking about 10%. And that was before, by the way, that was before the medical community um, bought into and still is some, uh, including behavioral addictions. So if you throw that in now, it's many more than one out of 10. But if you're at a party, the, uh, the odds are someone's going to be an addict there. Depends on if there's 10. Yeah, yeah, of course. If there's, if there's more than 10 people. Yeah, yeah. That's why, by the way, when I speak, to, to especially rabbis or any clergy, but rabbis in particular, I think it's incumbent, incumbent, absolutely necessary to find out who you're encouraging to make a lachaim. Mm. Before, it, we want to have camaraderie, we want to have fellowship, we want to be welcoming. That could, that, that is who, uh, I believe, that is who Chabad is. Um, and there's a great place for a l'chaim, absolutely, but yeah. not, for an, not for an addict. Unfortunately, yeah. Chabad has gotten that negative stigma attached to it, that uh, it's a place to go drink. You know what? And, and I understand the role. This is not, this is not a new thing. This is, this is a sacred um, way of people coming together and loosening up and, and connecting it, the truth is, is, it could be very holy. It is, not could be, it is. But as soon as you enter into the picture, a person with an addiction, then it definitely could be um, deadly. Look, the origin so, of alcohol is sacramental, right? That's why alcohol was created or wine and, and other sort of beverages are sacramental. I mean, obviously in the, in the Jewish community, we know that all of the greatest events are, are sanctified with a, a glass of wine. Right. And that's why it can be so confusing. And that's why we meet, you know, we have clients here that for me to, sometimes they're working with a counselor, whatever, and the counselor would tell them, you know, zero alcohol. No, I have to. And they'll end up saying, speak to, speak to, you know, the rabbi, because I have to explain to them, this is not, no, this is <laughs> specifically don't do it. Our, our, we've been having a sober, sober Seder for years. That's sober amazing. Seder. And actually, my kids growing up, they're always at a sober Seder. I was always saying, and they would have their wine, not kids, 15, 16, whatever it was, they would have their wine for the Seder purposes. It's kind of like under the table doing it. Everyone else is having grape juice. Because my kid, thank God, those kids who are doing that or those people, they're not addicts. So for a non-addict, they're it's they have to, it's law, they have to. But for somebody who is an addict, it's the opposite. It's interesting no. because that's why that's why I'm asking that question is that 
it's interesting to see like you now, it's almost like to you, it's a classification, but I'm just wondering how that person, to the person, how does that person get classified? So, not so simple. It's not so simple, but the way, if a person thinks there's a problem, if a person is being told it's a problem, it's worthy, it's, it's worth that to check it out. But they can check themselves also. And one of the way of thinking is, if it's not a problem, then don't do it for a month. Right. But not just don't do it, notice what's going on when you want to do it over the month. Mm. Notice, be mindful. What are you feeling now? What's going on in the body? What's happening around you? So that's one way. Because remember, it's Great a relationship. Advice. Yes. Yeah, but you know what? It's 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 good advice. But I'm just thinking about it now. It's easy for me to put that out there, but that means you're mindful. <laughs> that's not so you know. That's not so simple. But so it's not it easy. Take it's not easy. But but if, but if you, if if your friends are saying. Uh, you have a really problem, big problem with alcohol and you're like, no, I don't. And you can go cold turkey for a month and not think about it and not want it, to it not even be part of your life. Then obviously you're not an addict. But if you can if you can't do that, then you have to really check yourself and ask yourself that question. That's really what I wanted to understand. Now, I, I think that's a really great litmus test. Yeah, but I, I would also just clarify that part. There is such a thing as periodics. So there could be somebody who can go six months without a drink, right? right? Um, but that's a good beginning is to go for, let's say a month and to check yourself. And uh, there's other things too. There's, there's other ways also of, of looking at it. Uh, I think really crucial is uh, doing an assessment or a screening because- um, Can you do a screening? Yeah, sure. That okay. We offer that. Yeah. Our, our screening, it, we would go- we would go to colleges and CJEPs and meet with their counseling department. And one of the things we would talk about is our screening because our screening is very thorough. Mm -hmm. And for instance, we would ask people in, a, in the screening is your use of pornography, not as a moral question, but as a clinical question, just, you know, what's, what's... and you know what I heard a bunch of times was there's no way we're going to ask that question to our clients because we wouldn't know what to do if they, you know, so here you have people coming in to well-trained, caring clinicians who are not going to certain places with people. So, you know, how many students are smoking pot a lot and coming into the places who are depressed? Oh, absolutely. And they're not putting, so they're not putting it together. Absolutely. So, it's it's, it's self-medication, right? Could be. Yeah. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. So we still, uh, a lot of the, in the screenings, what will come out, what could come out is the traumas that might have led to the self-sabotaging uh, behaviors. So it's, it's good. But again, I think somebody knows. I think a person knows. I, I, I'm not 100% sure of that. That's why I'm asking that question. So, so I want to go to the next step because this is very interesting to me. So I, I now have an idea of how someone could know if they're an addict. Let's say someone knows, like you're saying, someone knows for however reason. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, who wants to, to, to be vulnerable like that? So to, to someone who has an issue and they're not ready to be vulnerable and they're not ready to, to go help, get help, what's your advice to them? Come on and zoom and leave your camera off and come and just be a fly on the wall of one of our Zoom meetings. We have two. You can have a now. Zoom. You, you, you can come to one of your Zoom meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And you can keep your camera off. Keep your camera off and don't put a name there. Just listen. You can be completely anonymous as it was supposed to be. Yeah. So you those meetings, anonymous. those meetings are, are critical. Um, to, critical accompanied by other things, but, but at least if you, if you want, if you, if you, like you were describing a person who's, let's say not ready or not willing. Okay. 
this is like a, such a uh, non-committal, uh, anonymous, really no effort. I mean, you know, you can be driving a car, whatever they're doing, you don't have to look. You can be part of a Zoom. That's one of the blessings of Zoom, I think, because you can have that type of... It's amazing. Because I've known people over the years who were in recovery, as they called it. And I'm not so familiar. I'll be honest. I'm not so familiar with the recovery community, but I've known people. And the way they talk about it, oh, I'm, I'm 15 years clean and I'm 20. It just becomes like, a, it's, like a, its own religion to a certain extent. And so not everybody wants to identify that way. And it seems, you know, I, to, 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 for some people, that's actually really exciting. And they, have, they can identify with people that way. And they have a, a shared community and a shared place of origin. But for some people, if they have an issue, they may not want to remember it. They may not want to know about it. I think, I think um, everybody uh, is, is, is different in a lot of ways. And I don't think there's one size fits all. Right. Um, there's a real importance about remembering it, though. I mean, that's no, you know, because if a person is an addict, or even not an addict, but let's say on the spectrum, right? So picture there's a, you know, you got a full blown addict, and you have for somebody who's never touched alcohol, right? So there's there's dependence over here. You keep on moving, there's like leisure over here. So somewhere on there, let's say they're around dependence, which means they're ne necessarily drinking with others. Now they're drinking on their own. Right. Okay. There's different ways of monitoring that. So if um, if a person is finding themselves in those areas, the the important thing is to know that this is something that's going to keep on coming back and biting me. Mm. So I need to remember, I need to remember, do I have to call myself on that? Do I have some people will insist? Absolutely. I don't know if that's the case. It depends on the person, whatever you can do to remind yourself, number one, you're not bad. <laughs> number two, you've got a struggle. Number three, everybody in the world has a struggle. Now, what do I do to deal with it? So calling yourself number one, number one, you're not bad. Number two, That's you have mean. a struggle. And number three, everyone has a struggle. So just deal with it. Yeah. Easier said than done. Absolutely. Exactly. But that's a really great formula. The first, knowing that you're not bad. You're not right. a bad person. It's not, don't be ashamed of it. Right. You're, you're not a bad person. Right. Right. And you know, one of the things that I love about Judaism, and I've thought about this, you know, I, I, I think often about core values. You know, someone asks you, what are your core values? What are the things that you live by? And I consider within Judaism and the framework of Judaism, I consider struggle to be a core value. It's not a means to an end. It's the ends. We say struggle, embrace the struggle, love the struggle. Struggle is a good thing. Maybe, maybe for myself, but you know, for somebody else. Well, I, I don't I, want to wish it on someone else, but I'm yeah, saying, yeah. I'm saying, and I don't want to wish it on myself too. Yeah, I also want, look, <laughs> no, it, no, know, but I, I'm not. See, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't necessarily agree with that because because struggle is a very powerful thing. I do wish it on myself. Obviously, I don't wish it together with suffering uh, or, or pain. Well, suffering is my choice, but I don't wish it together with pain. But struggle is an amazing thing, and it allows us to, to you know, somebody I, I used to tell me that whatever, the same thing that holds up the Brooklyn Bridge kills most people, right? Stress. So, so, so maybe not stress, but struggle, the ability to, to work through something and to challenge yourself. I think that is a very powerful, done in a healthy way. It's such an amazing power that we have to change and to become better yeah i think you know what you're saying is it's it's hard to admit i don't want to admit it because a big part of me always wants to have the easier softer way but the fact is it's only been what's been a struggle not only, but a lot of the times any growth has come through struggle but more important than growth it's not a, it's more about Look, there's God in this world, mm. right? There's God in this world, but 
the big but could be that I don't experience, I don't see, I don't feel, I don't know that there's God in the world. So now what's the approach? Am I going to struggle for that? In other words, am I going to do what I can to get rid of what's in between me and reality? I heard one said that the, the ultimate sign of sobriety is not not using, is a commitment to reality at all costs. A commitment to reality at all costs. I love that. It's a tall order, but I think, I think that's what we're talking about. So that's a struggle because we're not living in a, in a, in a, in a world, in a, in a system, in a place where it's all accessible. It's not. Right. Well, that's a fact. You know, God's not as accessible. Um, I'm not necessarily going to truly connect without some work, without some struggle. And some, well, I guess. But I, who, who decided? What year was it decided that life was supposed to be easy? I think it was 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. A lot of, by the way, a lot of, a lot of the people listening don't know from 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, especially 1970s. Yeah. Definitely it, not. It, You're yeah, ancient, it, man. I am, I am. <laughs> yeah, I am. Look, I mean, the, the, the fact is, one of the, one of the things that came out of the 60s and 70s was the struggle is, is useless. Don't, no, they're protesting the struggle. It's like, live free without struggle. And that And look last. what that's done. Yeah. Look what that's done to society. Right. Yeah, yeah, no question. Right? You, you know, know what's interesting? What's interesting about what you just said? Uh, um, we hear stories, right? I mean, we have 50, maybe 100 uh, uh, a year of people telling their stories because it's twice a week we have this. So if you times that by 15 years, one of the wow. common things we hear about one of the common things is people will say they wish their parents would have had more structure in the house. Really? Yeah. You think the opposite, right? But no, they wish there were more rules. Wow. Not, not rigidity. We're not talking about rigidity. That's just as dangerous as no rules. Right. Not the drill sergeant, the structure. The, the, yeah, the boundaries, right. the it's, guidance. It's, it's, it's the army without the drill sergeant. Yeah, good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. It's the structure. Yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah. an amazing nugget. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 know, I know so well that boundaries um, and, and learning about um, what I can do, what I can't do, um, these are all part of reality. This whole idea that you can do anything you want, just you did it. I, 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 where does that come from? Maybe I can do anything I want. I can't do anything I want. I can do anything that I'm meant to do. <laughs> but no, 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 no. So it's like, okay, give me that, you know, and that's what I'm hearing from people. You'd never think that. Every time I hear it, it's like, what? Yeah. No. You know, so going back to the 60s and 70s, oh my gosh, did that type of attitude create a lot of havoc. What's interesting today is that the kids today are a result of that without knowing it because they didn't live through it. So they have the results without the, the without the process. And so and yeah. so that's the great challenge is right. you know now we have to now think about what's meaningful and what's important and what's my life about. And we don't even have any structure to be able to to base anything like that on. This is a conversation that I seem to be having more and more today. So many yeah. people are talking about this today. I think it's, a, it's kind of like it breaks down to the difference between reacting and acting. See, I think that the, the carefree times of the 60s and 70s was a reaction to the rigidity of post-World War II. It was a reaction. So then they had this. And it, so we're like, you know, it's always we're it's finding the balance. I think that's what Judaism is, is, is I believe, is, is the message of the, Jew, of the Jewish concept is, yes, structure. Yes, but not rigidity. Yeah. I think yeah. every, every, every organization, every company has this problem because the, 
the CEO or the, the founder of the company had to go through a tremendous amount of struggle. The, the, the one who founded the organization had to go through a tremendous amount of struggle. Come in, you know, 20 years later or 30 years later, come some employee, they, the, 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 the culture of the organization still has that struggle within it, but they never went through it. So the, the, it's almost like the founder or the CEO wants them, the director wants them to live through that struggle. Yeah. With, but they never did. It's interesting. And I think that a lot of, and the, it's the same thing with today's generation. They're, they're, they're living through the struggle without knowing the struggle. And the result is that somehow they decided that life is supposed to be easy. And when life is not easy, they say, why isn't life easy? And it's all about what I need, what I need, what I need, my needs. And I would love to be able to change it and say, don't ask what I need, ask what I'm needed for. I, I would, I would yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. At the same time, I would, I would offer a defense. I would offer a defense. And I would say, when a person is of the opinion that things should be easy, and why is there a struggle? It's not because they woke up like that. I, you know, I think that the ultimate gift we can give to our children, and it's very hard and easy for me to say, because I'm a grandfather, I don't have little children, but if I can help my child with resilience, mm. if I don't empower my child with resilience, then why would they think that life is not easy? What is resilience? Resilience is the result of the struggle? Resilience is, is embracing the struggle Resilience is facing that which is in front of you, not being rescued. Resilience is being empowered um, um, by challenges that are, that are meant, are healthy challenges, tailor-made. Resilience has to do with no giving the space necessary for the other, for the child to be able to make mistakes. At the same time, know that they have your back. Mm. It's a hard thing to give as a parent. And how would you do that? If, 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 you, if, if a parent came to you and asked you that, how would you do that? How would you give your child that? Uh, I would say, first and foremost, look inside of you. Not, don't look outside yet. Don't look at your kid. How are you with resilience? Where's that at? And, um, and then I, I, I would look at that as a, as a personal uh, goal is to check myself and to see where am I with embracing struggle? Where am I with my attitude about um, wanting to be rescued, about resenting the, the world, about, about um, arguing with those around me? Where am I with my acceptance? Acceptance is, is very strong. It sounds like it's not. But to be accepting what's going on around me and knowing my place in it takes so much strength. So if I can get that, or and I'm not going to get that, right? It's not a there to get. If I can work on that and see it for what it is, then I can hopefully impart it to my children. My so, children, your, your children, you know, at, at, at a supper table, let's, let's just, I don't know, a supper table, children are there, right? Um, and uh, I don't know, the, the wife says to the husband something about um, how is your day, you know, and the husband says something, oh, there was a real problem with this is, uh, and if the wife can, if the wife would say back, he's an idiot, that guy, why are you always says that, or the other way, my husband, wife, whatever it is, or think about what that message is, right, versus, wow, that's tough, but you stayed with it or whatever it is. Children sponge, there's a sponge there. They get the idea that it's not, it's not about pushing everything away. It's about, and like I said, I'm a grandfather, so it's easier for me to talk about. But I think resilience, helping our children grow with strength and confidence is really their birthright. Um, it's interesting that when I'm listening to you, I'm listening to it's not what you're going to necessarily say. It's what you're going to experience. You're going to be, it's the nonverbal communication. 
more than the verbal communication. It's it's living by example. If you want something for your kids, you have to look at that within yourself, like you said, and you have to find that within yourself. And then you'll live by example. And by example, your kids will will pick that up. 100%. At the same time, you have to look at your parents. So in other words, just like I said, if you're not taught, if a, if a kid this nowadays is, is wants it easy because they weren't taught resilience, okay, well, those who are teaching resilience, did they get that taught? And especially the Jewish people, you gotta, you know, it's hard to wrap our heads around this, but it wasn't so long ago and it was forever, thousands of years where there was great threats constantly to our physical well being. Absolutely. Think about the stored trauma that gets passed on from one generation to another. I mean, my, my grandmother told me that, I don't know how this physically happened, but somehow they tied my, her father to a horse by his beard. So I don't know how that would work out. And they, they dragged him around, he was in, around town. I mean, and she, the little girl seeing that. She also told me that her, the town they lived in, there wasn't a hospital. So their mother was taken to a big city to the hospital and the father came back alone and the door opened and he said, where's mommy? Said, no, mommy died. That, that's another example of the struggle. And we are results of that. We are results right. of that. You know, I, 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 I sometimes say to my kids that when I was younger, I didn't get Hanukkah guilt. I got Hanukkah guilt. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. But, and, and I see that I look, I, I deal a lot with relationships. So I see that a lot with, Young people, I always, you know, in the Jewish community, there's a discussion about intermarriage. And I think the discussion has to change because young people don't want to get married because they don't have role models for relationships. Majority of them come from divorced and broken homes. So how would you expect somebody from a broken home to want to get into a relationship and have the tools to be in a healthy relationship? So how would, how would you expect somebody? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, yeah, Go please, ahead. please. How would you expect somebody not to come from a broken home? Right. We just talked about for thousands of years, the amount of trauma from one generation to the next. It's unbelievable. I look over here out my window as a Jewish general hospital. You know how that came about? In, in the, I think in the 1920s, there was a Jewish graduate from McGill Medical School who was working at a, as an intern at a local Catholic hospital. And the staff went out on strike because they allowed a Jew to be a doctor intern over there. I can't imagine that. I just can't imagine that. I, I've heard that story, and I'm sure you've, I mean, you, you, you for sure have heard that story so many times. Could you imagine outside your window, there's going to be a strike, and you ask them, what are you striking? It's because there's a Jewish doctor in there? Can you imagine? I can't imagine I, it. I could. I could. I could. I, I grew up uh, in a high school that had a lot of anti-Semitic violence. I shouldn't, I'm over-dramatizing. I, I, had, I, yeah, had I, I grew up in Chicago when I was 14 years old. Uh, uh, somebody, I was playing basketball with my friends and somebody came over to me with a gun and stuck it to my head and said, Hitler should have finished you off. Wow. I, 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 I'm well aware of it. I still can't. I still can't imagine that there's going to be a riot outside your, your building over there at the hospital because there's a Jewish doctor. But we do. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. We do live with this collective trauma. And so today, when we're, thank God, in a thriving world, the question is, how do we raise children who are healthy and, and, and not carry on i mean i think for you and i were it's already too late you know and i think that our parents have the best best intentions wanted exactly what we're talking about to not transfer that drop that trauma to not to do the best we can and i say to my kids sometimes i know you'll have what to talk to your psychologist one day about i'm sure you know and and really what i say that is because i want them to know that therapy is okay but <laughs> But at the same time, you know, I, and, and I'm happy that we got into this conversation today because 
I think that this are, it's a really important thing. How do we transfer this now to the next generation and, and, and raise healthy people? Because, you know, there's so many givens within the Jewish community. And I use the example of, of marriage as a given, but where are the tools to be able to navigate that? And that goes with anything, the struggle, the, 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 the addiction, where are the tools to be able to navigate? You know, if you have this, an issue, it's very, very normal to keep it inside, to not share it, to be ashamed of it. That would be obvious. It would take a tremendous amount of strength to say, I have an issue, or even to say, I don't know what a healthy marriage looks like. Or, and, 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 or, or I don't know what being a healthy adult looks like. And mm. then there's another element, and this is something that I see so much as a rabbi, and that is you'll have that moment of vulnerability where someone will come to you and they will share that. And it'll be just a moment, and you have a choice. Either you can ignore it or embrace it. Absolutely. Yeah. What brings us back to the original, you know, conversation um, that the original part of the conversation, which, which had to do with, am I here to, to accomplish or am I here to receive? Is it about, we, you know, we talked also because we had an Instagram, right? You, you had said some amazing things about how uh, is to speak. Um, are you speaking to listen or listening to speak? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I think the, the general thing that, that actually by us talking for the last few hours, which has been great coming up for me is we have uh, people to look at. We have uh, Judaism to look at, to, to learn from and to go forward with. One of the number one differences I see in the last hundred years with uh, oppression there's, there are people who are oppressed and what comes of it? If the people who are being oppressed become victims or people who become oppressed become leaders, that's the difference. So yeah. it's really about reacting versus acting. So does the struggles make me stronger or does it swallow me up? And we're in a culture, unfortunately, which somehow idolizes victimhood. It's like, it's the greatest thing. I have staff members, staff members who, who you know, not Jewish, and they will talk about, um, we need to involve a minority here, a minority there. I said, one second, you know, I'm Jewish. I'm part of the minority. <laughs> no, but you apparently, no. uh, uh, because you're white, you're not a minority. I, I'm not, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, you're Jewish, and Jewish people aren't oppressed. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, why not? Right. Why do we have why do we have the Jewish General Hospital here? Because the reaction, yeah. because because the reaction to the struggle was not to be swallowed up, but to go in and build the best hospital in Quebec. That's right. And you look at all the survivors, not all of them, of course not. There's no all, but the, I, I come from Jersey, right? That's where Schindler's List survivors ended up, a lot of them. You'd expect somebody who came from that type of trauma yeah. to become a a murderer, not a builder. How in the world could people who saw such destruction become builders? And they are. You know how many Schindler List street names in Jersey? Schindler List Ray, Schindler List Drive. Why? Because they're survivors from Schindler and they want to honor him. And they built whole sections of New Jersey. Complete communities they built with their own hands. They came, they came from Auschwitz with no language, with no money, they weren't construction people. They had no idea. They came and all of a sudden, I went to one guy. I went to one guy who was uh, fundraising then for um, Rabbinical College of America, which is where I worked for 17 years. And I went to one person's, uh, a survivor, and there was a big picture of a religious Jew next to the window. And there was a mall. The window was a mall, like right there. So the guy says to me, he says, you see that? I said, what? There's the picture, the, the, the window? Said, yeah, it's a mall. He goes, it's my mall. 
Okay. He says, but you know where I got that from? And he points the picture at a religious Jew who was his rabbi going back in Europe. Wow. You know? Yeah. Here's a guy who, and actually he's no person, but he, he, he came to America. He worked in a, a depaneur kind of thing because he had no skills, didn't have the language. Within two years, he owned it. Within a year or two after that, he had a few of them. And now he's got a mall. Wow. Then the survivors, this, and, and I thank you for bringing that up because the survivors are such a great example, the Holocaust survivors. And again, like you said, not all of them, but many, many were able to come and from nothing build incredible. I mean, we, we, especially I would say even in the Montreal Jewish community, we are so grateful to what they built because there's an infrastructure in the Montreal Jewish community that is so amazing. And a lot of that was the money of the, of the Holocaust survivors. It defies logic, Rabbi. Yeah. It defies logic. Yes. It's proof that there is a God. There's also that proof you... that, 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 that you could, that exactly what we're talking about, it's possible. It's possible to be able to come out of something that's so difficult, that struggle, that trauma, and build something amazing. And I think it translates to driving home with your kids in the car. If I'm driving home and the, uh, the kids are in the car and there's somebody going a little bit slow in front of me or it cuts me off or whatever it is, and I get angry and I point a finger, what that did was I just became in front of my kids a victim. Yes. Do I want the kids to know that they're a victim? They're self -right there's righteous indignation. Righteous indignation is the opposite, I believe, of faith. Yes. And we can make a point for it. He is a lousy driver. He is cutting me off. He's a, okay, okay. And therefore, it makes sense that I got pissed off. Okay, I get to, okay. But I'm not, then I have to be able to come back to the kids or whatever and be able to show them that, you know what? He didn't know it was me. I'm not a victim here. Yeah. I'll show him. I'll drive with my hands on the wheel a little bit slower or something. So I think that's the paradigm shift that, that we can learn from the past. There's nothing that we're coming up with. Yeah. This conversation has uh, taught me something very important amongst many things, but it's taught me, I understand why people come to you because you're very easy to talk to. You're, 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 you're vulnerable, you're real, you're, you're someone who you, who, who's, you, you can confide in. And I understand that now. And, and we need more people in the world like you. We really do. This, oh, this has been... So uh, an unbelievable, an unbelievable gift, this conversation. And, uh, and uh, if somebody, uh, if somebody needs your help, where can they go? So our website is a good first try. It's, it's ChabadLifeline.com. ChabadLifeline.com. And is there a way to message you directly there? Uh, confidentially? Uh, you, uh, yeah, you can just ask. But, but the beautiful thing you don't need to, because our staff are an extension. Our staff are all about, they have to be. This is the culture here, non-judgmental, compassionate, and the sense of urgency with guidelines. And, uh, but by all means, you can definitely message me through the website or through the calling here. And if they and want to support I, you, they can go to the website as well. You have a way. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. There's no waiting list, by the way. It's unbelievable. And this is Quebec, right? No way. Private. Can imagine. So, and, and that's, that's part of why you don't get government funding. So you don't have to uh, have that waiting list or have to deal with, with all that bureaucracy. Yeah. I don't know if that's bottom line is no waiting. list. That's amazing. Yeah. There's no waiting list. And uh, still 30% increase in the last two years. I believe in it. traffic and uh, thirty percent increase in expenses. What 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 is most of what you're seeing as far as the increase? Parents coming terrified of their kids being in their rooms all the time, wanting to know what's going on. So that how does that parents being terrified of kids in their room? How is that uh, ending up in an addiction center? So that's actually a beautiful development because it used to be, like you said, 
addiction was like those guys over there or whatever. They're not, you know, it's, it's yeah. taboo. Tab- now the word addiction and with the use of screens and phone, everyone knows or says about themselves, they're an addict. They can't get off their social media. They're good. So, but when things come up, like kids aren't coming out of their room to eat properly, like they're not with their friends anymore, they're staying like all kinds of things are going on. So at least, I don't know how always, but a lot of times, whether it's referrals from doctors or other places or community members, they're, they're seeing how this is not a um, situation of a kid just uh, wanting to be on his own. There's something more at work. And the way I, the way I can visualize it or maybe describe it is if you had, you know, you have your kid, 11 year old kid, um, and they have a, they have their front door or they have a door to the outside that there's no locks. So you don't see the kid going out, coming in. You don't see who's coming in, who's going out. And that's what the internet affords on 11, 12 year olds. The difference is that there are substantial, substantial uh, money out there looking for that kid's door to come in. So whether it's gaming which is a huge problem, huge problem, uh, um, or it's pornography, or it's social media, whatever it is, if it's an excess and it's taking a person away from normal functions, which it is a lot of times, then they should look at it as, is this addiction or not? And whether it is a reason, whether it is a thing, right? So that's what you're seeing more. Yeah. That's what I, we see, yeah, yeah. And I like that, like, it's true. It used to be othered a lot, and now... Um, that stigma has been broken, which is really special and really great. And I, and I hope that a lot of more people are being helped as a result of that. Me too. Thank you so much. And it's been really an honor to, to spend this time with you. I appreciate very much all that you do, all that you do, Rabbi. You're, you're, uh, you are a gift to any community that you're in. And I'm uh, grateful to be in your community here in Montreal. The, the, the feelings are mutual. Thank you.